why China? Why were you drawn to the China story or to some aspect of the China story? Well, I, I guess I should start by saying that um, I was sort of drawn to Asia on the whole uh, because uh, my n first overseas um, uh, assignment really was when I was recruited by NHK in Japan back in 1992. And that was kind of unexpected because I was at the time working as a local uh, news reporter uh, in the States. But it was an opportunity for me to go to Asia and discover this region that was still back then very underreported. Um, at that time, Japan was seen as the enemy because of all the accusations of car dumping. Um, they were taking over the world. They were buying up you know, swaths of the US, which obviously we're talking about now with China. So it's kind of a repeat of history in a different way. Um, so it was kind of an organic development for me, having then been in Asia, then being exposed to the rest of Asia. And interestingly, back then, China was not the story. You know, nobody was paying attention to China at all, because it was still very much a developing country. And so people were paying much more attention to Japan, um, somewhat Korea, but really it wasn't about China. Um, but then after that, I s was uh, transferred to Hong Kong uh, after working for CNN in Tokyo. They then transferred me to Hong Kong as uh, the anchor for CNN International. And it was right before the handover of Hong Kong back to China in 1997. That was pretty much a turning point um, for China in many ways because finally uh, they were released from British rule. and. I think uh, there was a lot of nervousness, nervousness at the time of what would happen. What I saw as a journalist being there on the ground reporting it for weeks and weeks, I mean, it was just a massive amount of coverage. You know, journalists from everywhere around the world came to cover this giant event. We all thought it was going to be kind of a non story, believe it or not. We thought it was going to be the most over reported under event. Because we just thought, okay, you know, it's being handed over. You know, we all knew this was going to happen, no surprise. But it was the emotional element of that story that none of us expected. And that's what I thought was very, very interesting. It was the idea that the Hong Kong Chinese, after 100 years of British rule, were finally going back to the mother country. And even though there was a lot of nervousness, there was still this idea of the cultural identity and being you know, brought back together. And so that was a story that I really didn't expect to tell in such an emotional way. Um, and that was the start, obviously, of the change in Hong Kong. Now, we've all, all obviously seen some good and bad results of, of, uh, of what's happened there. But, you know, it, for me, I think China now is the story, right? Um, it is pretty tremendous, you know, the way it's changed, the way it continues to change, and we'll get to this later, obviously, but, you know, it's an ever-changing story, and it's one of those regions where you can't keep up because it seems like every aspect of China is continually changing. So as a journalist, it's challenging. It's challenging. And then to explain how Asia works, and especially how China works, to a global audience, especially to a Western audience. And let's be, let's be very honest, the American viewer oftentimes isn't really interested beyond its borders. So it, it is something that's tough to explain, and tough to explain in a fair and objective way. Um, so, so yeah, so I've always been drawn to the Asian region, having been in Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, and then having, having gone to China many, many times to report. Um, anybody who thinks it's all the same and anybody thinks who, that China is all the same is, is insane. They don't know what they're talking about. So that's our job, obviously, as journalists to kind of expose that and give it some attention. That's yeah. great. And so maybe on the theme of insanity, <laughs> uh, or we, we move, we move uh, to Julie, because you were drawn to Japan. Uh, you were forced into Japan, and then you were drawn to it. Yeah. And so you had that experience. But to play off of this big story that May just discuss, discussed, the handover in 1997, you were in China reporting on China, reporting on Hong Kong at the time where Hong Kong was 
also emotional, but not in the same direction. Um, so kind of like May, I, my interest in Asia was started with Japan. I was a um, accidental exchange student to Japan in high school. I got assigned to Japan randomly and was sent there with like three weeks notice. I didn't speak any Japanese. It was very um, upsetting for me as a kid from Cleveland, Ohio, who thought I from Ohio too. Oh, oh okay. who thought I was like, you know, pretty with it young lady who just graduated valedictorian of her class and like was going off to Japan. I got there, I was like a complete infant because I couldn't speak any Japanese, I couldn't read any signs, I couldn't even use the toilet at my um, host family's house. It was one of those, you know, those great Japanese toilets that have all the uh, accessories. Well. <laughs> My house family had one of those first toilets and I couldn't read any of the buttons to figure out where the flush was on the first day and I managed to like get the wall all wet and everything. <laughs> it was a disaster. Um, but I it was really determined to um, you know, not let this defeat me. And so when I came back to the US after that summer, I wanted to continue my study of Japanese to keep in touch with my friends and family that I had made there. Um, you know, and I ended up then, you know, having a career in journalism in the United States, but um, ended up going to Hong Kong um, in 2009. Um, I moved to the New York Times um, during the financial crisis to be an editor in the bureau there. And so that was sort of where the shift for me started to happen. Um, I would have loved to work in Japan as a correspondent, but there were fewer and fewer jobs for um, American correspondents in Japan, just as Japan's influence started to wane and China started to go up. Um, so I found opportunity in Hong Kong, just like you did, and really started to get even more interested in, in that aspect of Asia. Um, and when the opportunity came to work for, um, to work in Beijing for LA Times, it was really, um, something not to be passed up because there's so many incredible connections between California and China and specifically Los Angeles and China that are not covered by New York Times or Washington Post or um, other outlets and I thought there was an opportunity to really tell some stories that other people weren't focusing on so um, and that's I hope I accomplished a little bit of that and one of those one of the stories that might not have linked LA and, and China, but was very important, was the umbrella movement. And I don't know if you could say something about coverage of that from Beijing and the absence of Chinese news coverage. Yeah, uh, what, you know, we were all kind of watching what was happening there in Beijing and um, debating when it was time to go down and then there was a sudden rush actually on Chinese National Day I think it was which is very disappointing to all the people who had set up um, ceremonies in Beijing and all the foreign press corps decamped to Hong Kong on that day um, you know for me having lived in Hong Kong before and then watching that unfold was really powerful I never Imagine that I'd see something like that happen in in Hong Kong. The the overwhelming size of the protest and the emotion, and then just the length um, was really quite incredible. Um, but when after a couple of weeks, we came back to the mainland and trying to interview people in the mainland about what they thought about it. Um, you know the the restrictions on what people in the mainland could see and learn about what was happening in Hong Kong were quite, quite intense. And um, there was very little um, news coverage that was seen outside of the, outside of the official reports. And, um, you know, I think mainlanders really didn't have a very good window onto what happened there. Um, so part of our role as foreign journalists, I think, was to try as much as possible to document what was going on there, um, both for readers, you know, back in the U.S., but hopefully some readers in China's too. 
Thank you. Uh, let's uh, pass it to Jonathan. Yeah. Now, Jonathan, you were in Hong Kong uh, well ahead of uh, the handover and things like that, but my first question still is about what gets you to China and China's periphery since you had so earnestly as a student uh, pursued a degree in Middle Eastern history. Well, <clears throat> six years in Israel working as a journalist got me, uh, I was exhausted. It was the Intifada, it was the Gulf War, and um, no, I was looking to move to, uh, to a different region. And at the time, it was the end of the Cold War, and Japan, which had held Israel sort of at bay, was engaging, and China was engaging more, and I was like, I, you know, that's where I should, that's where I should go, because I wanted to stay abroad. And my, I was actually, I went to Asia on a fellowship, and my proposal was, I mean, I was like, if I'm going to Asia, I'm going to China. Um, and I proposed to teach journalism at Beida, and uh, as part of this fellowship program. Um, and I left Israel, st studied Chinese intensively, and waited for my visa, and it never came. So I ended up on the periphery. So what I, I'm the outlier here. I never actually lived there. Um, well, you did, right? No, for a couple of months. months, okay. I went in and out of China a lot from Hong Kong, but my, my, my dream was, to, was to, to move there, and it still, in some ways, is uh, you know, a very strong desire. But, um, and I went there in 91, so I think that's probably one of the reasons my visa to teach journalism was not approved. Uh, it was still a little close to um, Tiananmen Square, but um, I did have the opportunity uh, to peer in, to go in, um, and every time I went into China, I'm like, wow, this is, this, is, this is real. I mean, I loved Hong Kong. Hong Kong's a great place to live, but I felt like the story really was north of the border. And then I came to appreciate, as, as, as May and Julie said, the kind of emotional story of the transition. And so I was there from 91 to 95. I didn't make it all the way to the transition, but in many ways, 94 and 95 were critical years that kind of set the course. And, um, you know, so I, I felt like I was able to peer in and then also see how the periphery was reacting to this momentous event. And I just want to pick up on something that, um, that May said, you know, the, the, this, this feeling of you can't keep up. Well, this was, I was there in the early 90s, and I felt like if I didn't go to China, uh, if I didn't go to Beijing every three months, I wouldn't recognize things. I mean, the pace of building roads and, and other things was so tremendous then, and it's, and it's only gotten faster and more impressive throughout the country. Um, and, and so, you know, I, that's, that was the part of the world that was changing the most at the time, and that's why I wanted to go be a part of it. Yeah, it's a, you know, the enormous transformation that took place, uh, you know, by the 1990s, and basically that's what we're talking about, 1990s and then the 21st century, uh, China is the story, right? Uh, Japan uh, begins to sink as this dominant economic player. China is rising. And the relationship among, between Japan and China has changed over that period. Certainly in the 1990s, it was a good relationship for the most part. But perhaps, Julie, you can talk about your experience as somebody who knew something about Japan and knew something about Japanese culture to how China was being, uh, or how Japan was being portrayed in China and why it was important to try and have American audiences understand that portrayal. Yeah, Clay and I were talking about this earlier um, today. I, I think you know, Americans are so unacquainted with so much, even our own history, um, but extremely unacquainted with Asian history in the 20th century, to say nothing of before the 20th century. Um, and one of the things I tried in my reporting to bring out was just how much um, the Japan's colonialism and the history of World War II um, still animate so much of the relationships and conflicts we see today. Um, and unlike sort of the um, 
the Marshall Plan or the way the U.S. and Japan worked together after World War II, partly as Clay has pointed out, um, because of Cold War dynamics, but really overcoming those um, those wounds of war to build some kind of new relationship, which really has not happened in Asia between Japan and many of its neighbors still. And I, there's reasons for that on both sides. Um, you know, China, um, Chinese Communist Party does a very good job of maintaining a very strong drumbeat of anti-Japanese propaganda through television, um, in museums, um, in all kinds. There's, you know, rarely an opportunity missed to um, bash Japan when it's convenient. Um, and it can serve political purposes even today. Um, and I think to, for Americans, it's really hard to understand like why there's so much tension between China and Japan, and and um, you know this little argument over these little rocks and what's that all about, and like South China Sea, like I don't get it. Um, and this all really goes back to um, that era, and um, it's animated, of course, by China's increasing economic and military might, um, but it's really underpinned by those old conflicts that have not been, really just have not been resolved in any kind of um, significant way. And I think, you know, part of that is um, an unwillingness in both country, in both China and Japan to look squarely at history um, and be honest about, about what happened on both sides. Um, so I hope, I, I don't know, I hope that in the future maybe um, we can see some kind of a little bit more honest appraisal and a, and a coming together in the way that the U.S. was able to with its um, World War II enemies. Maybe, May, you mentioned in part of your comments that you don't expect an American audience to have much knowledge about Asia or much interest. And yet, one of your jobs with CNN and CNBC was to make this relevant. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you did that, what kind of stories you tried to tell, and how you told those stories so that it would resonate with an American audience. Um, well, when I was overseas with CNN and, and CNBC, um, you know, unfortunately, I will say, I will openly admit, there, there, there always had to be some sort of Western or American angle. I, I shouldn't say always, but they preferred that, of course, because that's what would hook viewers to want to watch the piece. Um, the great advantage, I will say, with CNN, and I still say this to this day, is that CNN has its domestic broadcaster, CNN USA, right, which is what you see here with Anderson Cooper and all the, you know, all the you know, anchors here. But then all, CNN also has CNN International. And that's actually seen by a lot more people because that's broadcast worldwide. I mean, I used to have this big poster with all of our faces on it and the global map and the footprint of C uh, CNNI. And it was over a billion viewers. Uh, so we knew... I mean, I, that's why I loved working overseas as a correspondent for CNN, especially because we actually had more of an opening to broadcast to the world without feeling the pressure of having to Americanize everything. Um, so that worked to our advantage in terms of really being able to tell the story fully um, without having any sort of slant um, or subjective kind of angle. Um, but still, it was challenging because there were issues that were kind of esoteric at times uh, that we were like, well, you know, let's see if, if audiences around the world, especially in the U.S., would be interested. They were challenging, especially political stories that, you know, I mean, as we all know, J Japanese politics was very, very complicated back then because the prime minister, minister would change every six months, it seemed. Um, and then with China, what's interesting for me now is I work for CCTV, and that is, you know, huge media company that is government owned in China. But I'm given the assignment of giving the sort of Western global perspective of things happening in the U.S. to a Chinese audience, but also a global audience. Um, it's weird. 
I have to admit, it's, it's, it's sort of an audience that, you know, is sort of a moving target at times. Um, but what we try to do at CGTN, which is the U.S. network of CCTV, we try to report about the states, North America, and, you know, other parts of the world from a more global perspective. But also, CCTV, too, has an agenda. They want to talk about Chinese interests. You know, they would love it if every story made China look great in, in a very positive light. Um, so that tends to put some pressure on us as well. Um, I will admit that there have been a few stories that I've done that have been, you know, questioned by the editors um, because they thought maybe it didn't, you know, shine a very favorable light on China or the government. So did we, those stories run? Yes, they did, but uh, I had to fight. <laughs> I had to fight and I had to compromise. But I will be honest with all of you, and I'm sure you guys would agree, you know, uh, most outlets, broadcasting, print, um, you know, there's no such thing as a totally objective media outlet. Uh, every company has some sort of agenda, whether it's very overt, like Fox News, or very subtle. So because we are human, you know, we can't be completely objective about everything we talk about and cover. So therefore, there's always going to be some sort of slant, whether it's knowingly or you know subconsciously. And then when it comes to the network, it depends on who they are or what publication um, and you know what their what their viewership or or readers are hoping for. So it, that that is a bit of a challenge, you know, in terms of working for a gigantic entity like CCTV and knowing that it's the Chinese government. But CGTN gives us a lot of freedom, which is nice, knowing that we're working out of the U.S., so, so that's a good thing. And Jonathan, you worked uh, for Forrest and Economic Review, and Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, as well as Reuters, of course, but uh, when you were going in to report on China's economic rise, let's pick up on the question of what your audience needed, what your audience expected, what your editors wanted, that sort of thing. And then how could you get that story when you were just going in, you know, on a short-term basis? Oh, well, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, the first story I wrote out of China was um, in, uh, I think it was in August or, or September or October of 91. It was the first PLA march parade since Tiananmen. It was in Guangzhou. And there was tremendous sensitivity Around around that event, um, and but to be honest, you know, the story was th then it wasn't a, for me. It wasn't a political story. It was very m much more kind of impressionistic uh, about the reaction of the Chinese to the Chinese citizens to the army, and then after that, I focused on economic stories, which was uh, far less political. Um, I never felt pressure to take one uh, stance or another, I, you know, there was a, an old British tradition at the Far Eastern Economic Review, so, you know, if you're looking at Asia from British-controlled Hong Kong, that's about to not be British-controlled Hong Kong, there was naturally some history there, but I didn't, I didn't have any of that baggage. For me, it was just like a whole new world. Um, but what I would say is that as the, as the countdown to transition uh, proceeded, what was there was there was a lot of politics involved in the business stories. It was it was a time when China was expanding its influence um, in the media in the media industry. It was helping to organize industrialists in Hong Kong in different ways. Um, and again, to me, that was a uh, uh, it was a way to tell a story without assigning, you know, kind of blame or responsibility or, or warning to it. By then, the, the Far Eastern Economic Review had kind of made its transition to Dow Jones ownership, U.S. ownership. But what concerned me at the time as a reporter was that the, the Far Eastern Economic Review started writing editorials, they, and which were just like Wall Street Journal editorials, which were very, you know, free trade, China's dumping, you know, whatever. And it, like, to me, that changed the character of the magazine a little bit, but it never affected my 
you know, it never affected my reporting. I just, you know, and it, it kind of reinforced my desire to just tell the story and not, and not be swayed by one side or the other. And Julie, you, you had the greatest in-country experience and the most recent experience. And so maybe you could say something about news management in China and how the handlers in the foreign ministry affiliated office uh, would seek to help you in your work or to hinder <laughs> you in the work that you sought to do. Louder, please. Yes. Than you did before. Okay. Um, so working, yeah, working in uh, China can be challenging for foreign correspondents. Um, just some very basic things that you guys m might not realize, but uh, like often when you go to any kind of organized um, press event in China, there's an expectation that you would um, submit your questions in advance um, and that um, not all questions would be approved. Um, and actually a lot of debate in the foreign press corps about whether we should do that because um, it gives an opportunity for officials to like rehearse answers to things and it also gives them the opportunity to not take questions that they don't like. Um, and this would happen, uh, the most notorious example of that is um, after um, like a party congress or something where um, the um, Xi Jinping or uh, Li Keqiang will come out and give you know, what appears to be like an, 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 an impromptu sort of press conference, but it's actually very managed behind the scenes and to the point where sometimes in these things there have been um, people who've been called on as reporters from outlets that nobody's ever heard of, like some random Australian, I can't remember what was, agriculture magazine <laughs> or something. Um, so there's definitely some window we actually highlighted that in the advertisement <laughs> for this event, uh, was a ringer reporter. But, um, you know, it's also, I mean, in some ways reporting has gotten much easier in China than it had been. I mean, prior to 2008, for reporters based in Beijing, if you wanted to report on something outside of Beijing, you had to have permission to travel outside of Beijing. And often that was not granted. Um, when the Olympics came along, there was a relaxation of that, and now reporters travel pretty freely to many parts of China. Um, Tibet is an exception, and Xinjiang is another place where it can be very hard. Um, there's no formal restriction on going to Xinjiang, but once you get there, uh, my experience and the experience of many other colleagues has been you are constantly followed you are blocked from doing reporting that your life is made very difficult um you can be detained i had a friend detained um last week and his computer was confiscated i had an uh, interesting experience so um i went to kashgar and then wanted to do some reporting about some, um, that area had seen some violent conflicts um, in the months before I got there and I wanted to go, try to go to some of those towns and find out what had happened because there had been very little media coverage of it. Um, and uh, when I got to the hotel, you know, you check in and in your passport it says you're a journalist. So they, as soon as you check into a hotel, the hotel alerts the local police that you are there and then like half an hour later like the police show up at the hotel and they wanted to talk to you and ask you why you're there and what are you reporting on and then they would proceed to like call my guide like every hour <laughs> to find out where we were and then um, I went to another town and as soon as we got to find, to find out where you were or to check on see if you were saying where you, they already knew you were right all those things because they can monitor you electronically too they can trace your phone and stuff but uh we got to another town we went into a restaurant within like two minutes 
two guys in black came in and sat down at the next table. And I was like, okay. And they didn't say anything. And then we went out into the market to try to report. And these guys just like started walking like right next to me, like <laughs> right next to me. And they're like, you know, they don't have anything that says police on it, but they don't need to because it's pretty freaking clear who these guys are. So, you know, who, it's hard to get people in China to talk to foreign reporters. There's a lot of propaganda out there that says foreign media are there to just give China a bad name. And, you know, there's, so there's active um, discouragement for people to speak to foreign media. You put two big black clad guys next to me and like there's even less incentive to speak to me. This went on for like five hours. We walked all over the market, following, following, following. I finally gave up and decided to go shopping. And I went into the shop and I thought I'll buy some like a dress. The guy stood like outside the dressing room. And then we went back to the hotel and checked in the hotel. This, this town had no internet. They had shut off the internet um, in this town for security reasons. And the, guy, the guys in black just sat in the lobby of the hotel to see like when I would be coming and going. And so finally, you know, I, asked, I kept asking them, who are you? What do you want from me? And you know, the guys just kept saying like, well, we're here for your safety. And I said, well, is this town unsafe? Is the story that this is a very dangerous <laughs> Yes, this is so dangerous. Finally, those, we left that town, went back to Kashgar, and um, my, my first police friends showed up at the hotel. And I said, hey, do you guys want to have a beer? Because, like, you know, you, you want to talk about what I've been doing all week? And so we actually went to the hotel bar and had a beer, um, which was fascinating because you know, they knew wherever, well, every place I'd been, but I got to learn about them. One of the guys had learned English from a woman from Mississippi who came to Western China, <laughs> and he had all these questions for me about like jazz music and like how could he learn flamenco dancing, and he wanted to talk about, he had watched Dancing with the Stars, so like I learned a lot of interesting stuff about <laughs> them. But um, it can be a real challenge if you are trying to report a story that's very sensitive. Um, your life can be really, it, it can be difficult. It's amazing that really it hasn't Let's changed see. much um, over the years because um, for me, you know, I, I was reporting out of Beijing in 1996. We were doing some very big coverage and uh, I was doing a live shot um, and um, I brought it to Tiananmen Square and that's a big no-no. And um, the man with his finger on the button killed our signal, and we went to black. And uh, we had no control over that. And so, you know, it, it's still happening, obviously. There's minders all the time in China still where they follow you, and they're very open about it. And I think Xi Jinping, uh, you know, in recent years has really started um, trying to iron with a, you know, an iron, f rule with an iron fist, and so he's clamping down on a lot of media coverage as well. So I know that's a challenge for, you know, correspondents and uh, journalists in China. Um, and even, even the domestic guys there are having a problem, even getting information um, in any form. So yeah, it hasn't changed. It hasn't I'll changed. Offer a perspective on that because I, I was there before the information age, mm -hmm. uh, before internet, or just as internet was reaching Hong Kong actually. So I didn't have, you know, when I went into, to, to China, uh, you know, there was very little information in Guangdong about what was going on in the north. You know, there wasn't a lot of coordination. It was kind of open territory. As long as you, you know, as long as you, uh, you know, were reporting on uh, like non-political things, right? So I would go, you know, I'll never forget going in to report on like the uh, Peugeot uh, car factory. I mean, you know, Beijing Jeep was very famous, but there was a lot of investment going on in in southern China, and there were no restrictions whatsoever. How, but um, I was also there, and I started covering the media industry, which was when satellite, this was the advent of satellite TV. So it was pre-internet, uh, pre-apps, and, and social media. But China was seen as this, the holy grail of getting Western media, Western shows, uh, not so much news, but right. entertainment shows into, in, into China. And, it was very interesting to see the struggles that these companies were having 
to and the compromises they were having to make, including, including news organizations, because CNN at the time was really expanding. Um, and so you could start to see the, uh, you know, there, I think it was a period of openness and kind of and learning and trying to, you know, feel like, you know, China wanted to let in foreign investment, but also wanted to protect against subversive sitcoms and things like that. Um, but there wasn't, there wasn't nearly the kind of information control, um, you know, there was no electronic information control. There was, of course, CCTV and, and radio, but I found it to be, uh, um, you know, I, I didn't have those problems. I was never escorted away or, or denied an interview. In fact, again, by working on, in the South and in the periphery, you know, government officials would say, I mean, I went to report on a story of some, a, a former uh, Hong Kong police detective uh, pushing a golf course investment in Guangdong. And of course, there was always the need to have local uh, party approval. And, you know, again, these guys spoke a little more freely because they were so far away from Beijing. And there was a, 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 a party official in this town who said that, uh, you know, I mean, he's really, he's really enjoyed golf because uh, he knows he can talk freely without it being monitored when he's out on the golf course. And uh, so, you know, he said it in a lighthearted way. He wasn't threatened by me, but I don't think there would be that candor sometimes today. Well, certainly not bragging about being able to negotiate deals that you can't negotiate uh, in a boardroom out on the golf course. The golf is, is verboten now, as well as yeah. speaking out of turn. But you get to this question about working with sources. And you've worked in different contexts and different medium, but maybe you could say something about two things. One, you know, how do you build trust? How do you establish a relationship to get the information that you need and to serve your readers or viewers somewhere else? And then the second question has to do with this technological revolution. Uh, you know, you're there when the fax machine is the cutting edge technology, and later, now we're talking about uh, facts being so out of date, our students don't know what they are. Yeah, you should address Well, that. let me just say, China is a land where the facts lives on. If you <laughs> ever want to request an interview with a government official, you have to fax a letter. So, you know, don't, you gotta don't teach your me. students how to use a fax <laughs> machine, because otherwise they'll never be able to to, to contact the State Information Council. Um, so uh, don't neglect that part uh, of we, the we curriculum. That <laughs> but the point, the point being that there are so many new ways uh, by which people communicate. Yeah, um, well just about sourcing. I mean, I think building sourcing is really hard an anywhere. Um, there's just so many added layers in China, you know, in the relationship there's there's the foreigner to Chinese um, barrier. There's um, the language barrier. I mean, even though like I speak Chinese to some degree, like oftentimes I, if I go to Wenzhou, nobody can understand me and I can't understand them. And even if I bring my interpreter, it's like has a hard time understanding each other. Um, so it's tough and working through interpreters is tough and that's a skill unto itself that I had to develop. Um, but we also relied on our news assistants and sometimes when I thought somebody wouldn't respond to me initially well, like I would use the news assistants to reach out first, um, just to like the first voice on the phone not to be a foreigner can, you, know, you have to think through, like, what is this person, where are they coming from, what have they been told about interacting with foreign media, what are the risks for them of interacting with foreign media, and you have to really be sensitive about that, because the stakes can be high, um, especially for people in government or academia. Um, it, it's frowned upon often to talk to foreign media, so you've got to be, You've got to be careful, um, and you really have to appreciate anyone who does open up to you. And before we before we go to May on this, one of the things that I want to note is that Julie has been a mentor 
to one of our graduates, to Yang Ying Zhe, who worked for the LA Times and is now working for the Financial Times. And so, you know, Ying Zhe worked as a news assistant and helped, helped in that role. So you want to know about sources and then also? About technological oh, tech. change and how that, yeah. how that changes news gathering and right. news dissemination. Yeah, I'm with you, Jonathan. I mean, it, I started in journalism long before we even had computers, really. I mean, I was using a manual typewriter at my first job. So, um, so that has obviously revolutionized the way that news is gathered. And unfortunately, it's had a negative impact, too, because as we all know, anything can, can anyone can post anything, whether it's true or not, right? And so there's a lot more responsibility as a journalist to really double check, triple check anything that crosses um, because there is this irresponsible nature of social media and, and uh, digital media. Um, with China, though, you know, it's limited. Um, Weibo, you know, there are these all these apps that are Chinese created, and so and they're massively used. But Facebook's not there. You know, YouTube's not there. Um, so there's a big uh, area of social media that is not shared within China. So there, you have to use other means to try to reach that audience. And I do so many stories now on how the younger generation of China is communicating, and they are using, uh, you know, digital media like you know, like crazy, but they have their own form. And so, you know, when I do business stories about how businesses are here in the U.S. are trying to cater to the Chinese tourists and, you know, they all know that they have to have a separate China strategy that has, you know, that uh, reaches out to their social media platforms and their ways of communicating. Um, so that's definitely have an Im having an impact. Um, as far as uh, sources, yeah, you're right. It's very hard to cultivate sources that trust you, um, and particularly in this day and age, where the media is demonized, particularly by a certain someone in this country who um, s calls us the enemy of the state. Uh, so that's not helpful. Um, so it, it, it's a bigger challenge than ever before uh, to to get sources who trust you and who will you know, divulge information because everybody's nervous, right? They don't know where it's going to show up and they don't know how it's going to be used. So that makes people a little bit more hesitant to open up as much as maybe they did in the past. Um, and then working overseas, yeah, it's all about the assistants and the producers, for me, who are local, native, you know, uh, folks who know, you know, uh, they, they know the area, they know the culture, and they're able to sort of penetrate that initial uh, blockade. And then we can try to get through to, to that person. Um, it certainly helped having CNN as, you know, our first entree into anything, because everybody know, knew who we were. That made a li life a lot easier. But, um, but it's challenging. It still is today. Yeah. After after the anti-CNN movement in China, I'm not sure yeah. that that would have been a door opener necessarily. Right. I mean, I will say that I think the spread of technology in some ways has opened new avenues for finding information. Like, um, there was a huge explosion um, 2015, right, in um, Tianjin. Mm -hmm. In Tianjin, there was a big, explosion a bunch of like chemicals that have been stored at this dump basically blew up and this site was amazing i mean i immediately like got in a car and drove there and i could like basically drive right up to the crater before they sort of controlled the area but um that was an event that was censored on chinese social media but there's still lag time and so you were getting a lot of stuff that was being posted by people, and it was eventually it was taken down rather quickly. But um, we do like latch onto things like that that in the previous day and age you just would have never might never have heard about, or would have been much easier to suppress or minimize or diminish. Um, and actually, when I was out there reporting that story, we met several um, young Chinese who were kind of working as like independent journalists. I mean, this is a risky thing to do, but they were out there gathering information and they were broadcasting it through various um, like live streams and other um, 
forms of social media kind of like underground news. Um, and those places, th those things do exist in China. And there's lots of obscure like bulletin boards or ways to kind of figure out people and contact them through like WeChat or Weibo. And these are sources that we never would have had before. It would have been very hard to find people. And that's made actually an incredible difference in terms of the variety of people we can contact and and reach out to. And also like for me even, you know, if I can type a message to someone in Chinese in WeChat and you know, even if they're in Wen Wenzhou, they can understand me, you know, just through typing, whereas before my only option would be to call them on the phone and we couldn't talk. So And there are a jillion users in yeah. China, so you can reach a massive well, audience. you can reach people in different places, in different uh, different sectors, all of those kinds of things. The unauthorized reporting, though, there has been a clampdown on that, uh, and particularly for news portals not to use those, use those sources. Uh, Jonathan, if you could talk about the source question, and specifically to compare your experiences reporting in China with reporting in India, you know, and you know, how you were able to cultivate sources and the, the differences there. Well, well, the, well, India has the, I mean, everyone thinks all Indians speak English, which is not true, uh, but even if 300 million speak English, <laughs> that's a big advantage over, of, over other places. So the language, the language barrier and certain educational traditions was a big difference. Um, I mean, at the time, China was still, uh, I mean, India was just barely opening, but the British had been there for a long time. Um, you know, China, it, there, there wasn't, there weren't so many Chinese students here. There weren't as many professionals who had lived abroad. So a lot of times it was, uh, it really was a, you know, um, the multi-layered challenge that, that, that Julie, that Julie mentioned. I, I mean, I, I'm probably not the best person to answer this in all honesty because I would go in and out reporting on different mm -hmm. stories. I would have sources for particular stories, not necessarily ongoing sources. But you know, I, I, I generally felt, um, again, at the time, it was easier to talk to people the farther away you were from Beijing because there was just felt to a lot of people there was more autonomy. Um, and there was also, at the time, such a curiosity um, that People were, just as you were interested in your minders, people were interested in a foreign reporter. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to be a reporter, to go to places to report new things. And so the interest was both ways. I never, you know, with India, um, Indians are very willing to talk, um, as you might know. And <laughs> that was never, that was never a problem, <laughs> uh, getting people to talk in India, just as like it's never a problem for the Indians to whip up a protest of, of tens of thousands of people. Um, but the, they also had a tradition of an open press, a wildly open press. Um, so I wasn't seen as threatening in any way. I was seen much more as a threat to like foreign businesses for a, a potential negative story that would hurt their, uh, hurt their investment in India. Right, because uh, we were, I was writing for an American audience uh, about all you know, politics and social issues and business, but the greatest implications were when money was involved, when dollars were involved, U.S. money and U.S. investment. So, um, you know, India is a, a freewheeling place, which is uh, not like China was when I was there, and I think. As May said, it, 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 it comes. I think it opened up in ways, and there was a comfort level on many levels, and then, you know, and then the information age added all these resources for reporters and outlets for more people, but then it also gave the Chinese government tremendous leverage, um, ultimately. So it was kind of like a night and day experience, I would say. Yeah. And we're seeing that leverage put to good use uh, these days, or put to use in any way. Uh, we're going to open it up uh, for questions to the audience, but before we do that, one last question, and that's the story not told, the story that you wish you could have told, but for reasons of time, reasons of access, trying to convince an editor, whatever it is, 
Is there a story or did you say everything that you had to say during your time reporting from China? Again, I'll, I'll go last. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, there's no, there's plenty of stories to tell. <laughs> um, and bec like I said in the very beginning of this talk is China changes every other month and um, it's expanding so rapidly and it is becoming a major global player. Um, and you know, their ultimate goal is you know, they're, they're gonna be a superpower if, if they aren't already. So with being a superpower, you know, you want to be able to pretty much um, uh, get into every area of business and culture and society and military and, you know, in every region. And even just from a CCTV perspective, that's exactly what CCTV is doing. Um, they are, ev we are everywhere. We're everywhere. We're on every continent, every region. Uh, with the 25 channels that CCTV has, they have over 2 billion viewers worldwide. That dwarfs any other media company. Um, so because of the size and the magnitude and the influence of, of uh, China, there are a multitude of stories, you know. I think the biggest challenge for journalists is can we even get to those stories and can we tell them properly? Um, that's the biggest challenge for me. And remember, I'm in a very pe peculiar position because I work for the, technically I work for the Chinese government. Uh, so somebody told me once, and I, I, I'll leave you with this, I, I got a little frustrated at one point. Um, because I had come from such a Western journalistic background, and I said, I don't know about this, and they said, you know what, May? Better to be on the inside and be able to have some sort of influence and to be able to learn from the inside and be able to tell the story. Um, and I thought that was a very wise thing that this person told me. Uh, so instead of thinking that I was being, you know, um, barricaded or there was a barrier that I could not penetrate, I had to sort of turn my thinking in terms of, no, I'm on the inside, I'm kind of understanding how the Chinese are thinking in terms of their global perspective and their strategy. So therefore, as a journalist, maybe I can see it from that way and tell the story in that manner. Um, and so that's my approach right now, but specific stories, too many to, too many too many to name. To list. Too many to name, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a jillion stories I would love to be able to report or tell. I mean, everything from, you know, what's going on on the China-North Korea border. I mean, I was in North Korea um, last year and seeing how much um, that economy has improved was shocking and says to me there's a lot going on with China there and just that's a story that I wish I'd been able to spend more time on. Um, you know, Tibet is still quite off limits, and I feel like we really don't have a good grasp in the outside world of what's going on there. Xinjiang, still also highly controlled, um, concerning um, human rights, definitely um, ongoing concern there. But I think for me, one of the greatest challenges actually was just trying to tell human stories and make Chinese people like real to my audience um, and really get at the texture of like what it's like to live in China in the 21st century and be part of this incredible transformation in society and, you know, to capture the feeling of so many ordinary Chinese that their country is going somewhere good, like lots has changed and their life is better than their parents' life is, and, and the country's going somewhere positive. Um, a lot of Chinese really do believe that and, and I'm not saying that they're wrong. Um, and to sort of capture that I think is, um, is difficult but important. I also just think like the rhythms of Chinese life are, can be very interesting. I mean, one very small story I did that I just, it was a total whim and I, I got incredible reaction to it. I don't know if you remember the story, Clay, but it was about a guy selling a turtle. I was driving home one day after some like press conference and I turned onto the little side road by my compound on the second ring road in Beijing 
which is a very highly urbanized area. I mean, this is like getting off the 10 freeway in downtown LA. Um, and there was a dude standing out there on the street with like a fishing pole and dangling from it was this like giant turtle. And I was like, well, that's not something I see every day. <laughs> So, like, I passed him, and then I, like, slammed on the brakes and, like, reversed the car. And I got out, and I was just like, what's up with the turtle? <laughs> He's like, well, I'm selling it. I'm like, well, where'd you get it? Like, we're in the middle of a city, you know? And he tells me the story about how he's like, he's a construction worker, and they're digging this ditch, and he's like, found this turtle, and it's, it's yeah, it was live. And uh, it's good for soup, and um, my husband would really like it. I don't have a husband. Um, you know, and then another woman walks up and starts, like, negotiating for the turtle. And, you know, like, she's, like, they're haggling. And then I'm thinking, should I buy the turtle and let it go? Like, you know, like, I'm ha then, then, like, the next day I saw another guy selling a turtle. And then I'm like... Is there like a turtle warehouse somewhere that these guys are getting these like big turtles from? Like check them out on consignment, try to sell them. Like I don't know, but like there's so many interesting little things like that in China that don't, you don't see in the U.S. And just trying to capture some of those like quirky, bizarre, fun things and these random people you meet in China is wonderful. And I, the reader response I got to that story was like completely unexpected um, but I think it's because people really want to know about just like ordinary life and I mean I think to this yeah they're like slice of life story yeah right? I mean we hear so much real. about China in like big numbers like billions of people and the economy is this trillion and you know it's all kind of like aggregated up into something that's so hard to digest and I think getting to those individual stories and humanizing China brings us together one of your stories that you co-wrote uh, was on the mandate in uh, preschools that kids mm -hmm. use chopsticks. Oh, right. No more spoons if you're four years old. You've got to use the assigned technology. And the interviews that they had with mothers who were concerned about whether or not the kids would be able to effectively get enough food using chopsticks. <laughs> It, 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 it's a terrific story, a terrific story, and just one of many. Jonathan? Well, and, and again, I'm kind of the outlier because right. I didn't, you know, I wasn't living in China, but uh, the, the one story in my time in Hong Kong that, the one China story that I had reported that I never wrote was not because of an editor or because of source uh, sensitivities or anything else. It's just because I didn't get my act together. Um, and it was, but it was also a kind of a cultural story about how diehard, foreign socialists who had moved to China, how they felt about the, you know, China's change, the end of the Cold War, and it was tied very much to, um, I, I mean, I got the story because I, also, I broke the story of uh, China's decision to establish uh, diplomatic relations with Israel. And when I was there during the foreign minister's visit, I, you know, was fascinated to meet all these American Jews who had been socialists, in the 40s, they went. I mean, Sidney Rittenberg was yeah. one of them, but there was a there was a different group. I mean, he, you know, he had already left at that point, um, but there were a lot of people. They still lived in the Friendship Hotel, um, and they they didn't they hadn't talked about they hadn't talked. Mm -hmm. And other journalists who were based there were like, "You got them to talk? Oh my God!" And then I left, and I got tied up with something. I never wrote the story, but it was really a story about how outsiders who became insiders then felt somewhat disaffected by the change of the world and in some ways China's response to it, but at the same time they had been, you know, sort of anti-Zionist when they were socialists and now they were feeling this pride of relations between Israel and China. So it was a really kind of historical, like cultural sweep, but I, I never wrote it. 